Come on, somebody put your hands together for the Lord in this place this morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So great to be home and so delighted to see so many of us, so many of you with us this morning. And uh, if you have your Bibles today, I want you to take them out and turn them to the book of 2 Kings, the 13th chapter, or turn them on and turn over to 2 Kings, the 13th chapter. As many of you know, we have been in a sermon series. This will be the bookend message this morning. But we've been in a sermon series entitled Heroic, Heroic. And this morning, I want to share a message that I have self-entitled Heroic Almost. Heroic Almost. Now, those of you that know me or spend any time around me or are here and frequent the doors of this place on Wednesday nights, you know that 2 Kings chapter 13 is, is one of those blocks of Scripture. Thank you so much, Mr. Chris Bates. Uh, that when I get some alone time, like I had this week, between me and God, I go back to it. How many of you know you can read the Word and see new things in the Word every time you read the Word? How many of you know this book is alive? It's not a novel like every other book that you read. It's not a movie that you watch and you take all the meaning away the first or second time you watch it. Every time we get in this Word, it speaks new things to us. This is one of those life passages for me, and this morning I get to share a little bit of the overflow of my personal life, my personal study life, and my personal passion with you as a bookend message for Heroic Almost. If you're uh, joining us this morning for the very first time, and uh, you're a guest here today, we want you to know, as Pastor Tyler has already so eloquently done, that we're excited that you're here. We are honored you would be here, and we want a chance to get to meet you. You would never know, unless you were in the meet and greet room, how many people come back weekly and say to us, we've been here for four months, we've been here for six years, we've been here for two years. And this morning, we want to get to know you. We want to get connected. I consider it an honor and a joy to serve here. Consider it an honor and a joy to have the opportunity to meet you this morning, to preach to you this morning. So please, after our time together today, make your way down the hall. There'll be people holding signs that say, my first time, follow me. Just follow the signs. We'll have our staff back there and we'll help you get connected and get to know us as we get to know you. And last thing, before we get into what God's placed on my heart this morning, for every man, every man, every man in the room today, I want to make sure that you all receive one of these little cards. It's got a word on one side. It's the title of our sermon series, Heroic. If you're a man in here today and you do not have one of these heroic cards, I want you to lift your hand up right now. We've got ushers standing by waiting to bring you one of these. I see Mr. Tristan there on the back row. What's happening, Dex? You got one of these? I need you. I need, yeah, you. I want you to fill that out. I need you here serving. Everybody else got one of these today? All the men, we want you to have one. It's going to be important at a point in time during our time here together today. Well, as we were watching the video from Pastor Shane, and we're all excited for next Sunday for him to come back and tell us all that the Lord is doing for our ministry and for our church through his travels, through his ministry, and through his meetings with Oakland and, and with a, a group in Denver about our television station, I want you to know if you're not coming on Wednesday nights, and I'm not just saying this because I'm the one that preaches, we have a great time on Wednesday night. And this coming Wednesday night, thank you. Uh, for those of you that do come on Wednesday night, I've got so much that I want to share in, in detail, just a little bit, of some cool things that God did this week. All I know is God must have had Major League Baseball on his heart and on his mind. I'll just leave it at that. In light of Houston not only winning, uh, the World Series, but I got connected with a couple of Major League Baseball players totally opposite of each other, one for the Milwaukee Brewers and one that played for the Yankees and the Cubs. And, and I just want to tell you all about crazy, crazy, just really God's stories. But this morning, my heart's filled in a different direction. So you got to be here Wednesday night. I want to tell you some of the things God's doing through our church and our ministry here. Second Kings chapter 13, again, heroic, almost. Heroic almost. Verse 14 says this, And Elijah became sick with an illness of which he would die. What? Then Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face. This is what the young king said, My father, 
My father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and some arrows. So he took himself a bow and some arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, Put your hand on the bow. So he put his hands on the bow. And then Elisha must have got up out of his deathbed, put his hands on the young king's hands. And he said, Now open the east window. So the young king opened the east window. And then Elisha said, Shoot. And so the young king shot. And he said, This is the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from the Syrians and the Syrian army. For you must strike the Syrian army at Apex till you have utterly destroyed them. Verse 18, then he said, now take some arrows. So he took them and he said, strike the ground with them. So he struck them. Watch this three times. One, count with me, two, three. And he stopped. And the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck the ground five or six times. And then you would have struck Syria till you had destroyed it. But now you will only strike the Syrians three times. And then watch this. Elijah walks away, crawls back up in his deathbed, and he died, and they buried him. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, a window is closing. A window is closing. Bow your heads with me for just one word of prayer. God. You know this morning I've already prayed this and I pray it again. I have prayed it privately, now I pray it publicly. God, it's my sole intention, my purpose today for this church, for each and every one of us to have a kickstart, a jumpstart, if you will, for our faith. God, help us to remember that this journey, this pilgrimage that we make here with but our few years on this earth is a pilgrimage of faith, that there's more than our mundane lives, than the repetition of what we do as employees and business owners and moms and dads and sons and daughters. It's about more than the color of the carpet and the paint on the wall and three songs and who's leading what ministry. God, help us today to have eyes of faith, jumpstart our faith, kickstart our faith, God, to believe that you are a rewarder, that you are miraculous, that you are powerful, that you are supernatural, that you do love us and that you're working for us. If you would agree with me for that today in your life, come on, if you want that for you and your family, for your finances, just shout a great big amen. amen. Come on, if you don't want it, I want it. I feel like Pastor Shane, if you don't want your blessings, I want your blessings and my blessings. I'm a blessings hog. Come on, somebody, say amen. Say, I want it. I want everything that he has for me. Thank you so much, Pastor Chad. Come on, would you guys put your hands together? Wasn't worship incredible? Isn't it amazing that we can all gather together from all various walks of life and come together for the sole purpose of exalting the name of Jesus and feel God in that way? I hear people wailing. I see people kneeling. It's just wonderful, and I thank them so much for the effort that they put into leading us in worship. Well, this morning... I want to bring a character out of the pages of your Bible to the forefront of our discussion today and to our conversation that you may not be aware of. Um, I know that during this heroic series, Pastor Shane, in the very first message, said that all of us as pastors today have become keenly aware of how many people, even in the South, don't know the basic or elementary characters of the Bible. How many of you know you can get in a conversation with somebody at work? You can get in a conversation with somebody at school. You can get in a conversation with somebody at the movies, and you can bring up Jonah. And some people not know who Jonah is. They don't know the basics of Jonah's story. And, you know, for many of us, we may have learned those stories in Sunday school. We may have had moms and dads that took the time to teach us. Maybe some of us come from a walk of life like me, that the only time you ever go to church is when somebody else's parents take you to church. But this morning, nonetheless, I want to bring a character out of the pages of our Bible that isn't a prominent figure. He's actually an obscure person. He can be lost, King Joash, as one of the many kings in the kingdom of the nation of Israel. Again, this morning, I want to talk to you about being heroic almost. King Joash will be our subject today, but 
in order to explain to all of us and to do what I do and use my gift in bringing the pages of the Bible to life, I can't start with Joash. I actually have to start with one of the prophets, the prophet by the name of Elisha. Does everybody remember him? He's the spiritual mentee. He's the spiritual son of the prophet Elijah. Now, scripturally, I know today in many organizations and in many Christian organizations, we have processes of transferring leadership. But the best model for transferring leadership always is the Bible. And the Bible sets forth a principle in both the Old Testament and the New of a father to a son, a mentor to a mentee. That's why men of God stand in pulpits and podiums and in classrooms, and they teach us that we all should have a Paul in our lives, someone over us in the Lord that can speak directly to our life, to our circumstances, to our situations. We all need a Barnabas. We all need somebody encouraging us. We all need a Silas, somebody to do ministry with. And we all need a Timothy. We all need a son whom we're pouring what we've learned in God into so that they can outlive, out accomplish, and outrun us in the ministry. Does anybody still believe in that structure of leadership and believe it's scriptural? Come on, put your hands together for that. That's good. I don't care who you are. Elisha was actually, are you ready for this? He was the dean of students of the first school of ministry. When you hear Pastor Shane talking about being, Oakland, being in Oakland for a board meeting, for the accreditation of our school, which our school is nationally accredited. Am I right, Miss Kristen? We have a board that oversees that. Pastor chairs that board. And we hear about schools of ministry and we think, wow, schools of ministry must be a new thing. Did you know that the very first SUM, no, not an SUM, did you know the very first school of ministry is found in the pages of the Old Testament? It was called the School of the Sons of the Prophets. It's in the Bible. It was a ministry school. Read 2 Kings. And the book of 2 Kings says the dean of students there was the chief prophet of the nation of Israel by the name of Elijah. Elijah was the dean of students, and he had a school of prophets whom he was raising in the office of the prophetic as a school of ministry. You say, remind me of where I can see that in the scriptures. I'm so glad you asked. You remember when Elisha was taken up into heaven by the whirlwind, and Elisha, the spiritual son, the mentee, said, I'm not letting you get away from me. I've got a good friend. He serves on church staff here. I won't tell you which one it is. He and his wife were picking one day, and she said, I'm about to leave. And he said, where are we going? She said, no, I don't think you understand. I'm going. You're staying. He said, no, I don't think you understand. Where you go, I go. When you leave, I going with you. You ain't getting away. I know I outkicked my coverage. I married up. That went over like a lead balloon for some of y'all. I feel the same way about Miss Brooke. You ain't going nowhere. We going together. The young son in the face said to the mentor, he said, oh no, you ain't getting away. Where you go, I go. But when that process of transfer was happening, many of the school of the prophet students looked to Elisha. Do you remember that? 50 of them. And they said, do you not know that God is about to take your master, Elisha, to heaven? See, they were in the school of ministry. They were in the school of the prophets. They knew God was getting ready to take the dean. But what they did was stand back from afar, and Elisha, the true son, said, I'm going to make every step that you make. Can I show you the school of ministry in the Old Testament? They actually had a building. It was too small. Sound familiar? You find that in 2 Kings chapter 6. And what they did, the dean of students took all of the school of ministry students down, and they began to cut trees, and they built them a bigger school with their own bare hands for the school of ministry in the Old Testament. You say, Pastor John, I thought we were talking about Joash today. We are. Again, I've got to teach you about Elisha, the chief prophet, the dean of students, and the transfer that took place from him to his son in the faith, 
Elisha. Now, do you remember what Elisha cried out for? He cried out for a double portion of the anointing. Isn't it interesting, and isn't the word so spectacular and wonderful, that the Bible records that Elijah had seven miracles. And then the Bible comes back and records that Elisha had 14 recorded miracles, exactly a double portion. The last of which is where I'm driving the conversation. Do you remember the last miracle in Elisha's ministry? It's when the Syrian raiders were coming in. Somebody say ISIS. When you go to Israel, you'll figure that out. The Syrian raiders were coming into Samaria, Israel. Some Israelite men were burying another Israelite man. One, two, and they looked up and they saw the Syrians coming and they said two and a half and let him go. When they threw the Israelites' body into a sepulcher, they did not know that it was Elisha's sepulcher who died with the anointing in his bones. I'm going to bring it to you. I'm going to show you. When they threw the dead man's body in Elisha's tomb and the dead Israelite's body touched Elisha's bones, the scripture seems to suggest that the dead man became a resurrected man, crawled out of the sepulcher, and outran the men that were burying him, fleeing from the Syrians. Does anybody remember that? Why is that all important to us today? It's important for this reason, to help you understand something about King Joash, Glenn Hicks. You ready? Here's what it is. The reason that Elisha was able, Elijah was able to transfer the anointing to an Elisha is because there was a hunger in the children of Israel for the ministry of the prophetic office. There were people pulling on him so much that they would build their own school. They would fund their own way. They would pay their own way. And one of those students was so determined, even when they knew God was about to take him, he said, I'm not leaving you. I'm going every place that you go. And watch this. Elisha's last ministry was parting a little river so he could step across. Elisha receives the cloak, and Elisha picks up the ministry where Elijah left off, and he parts the same little river and steps over with the cloak. He picked up where the spiritual father left off. Isn't that amazing? the word records that but the reason Elisha goes down in the grave with the anointing in his bones are you ready for this because Joash is the 12th king of the nation of Israel and the nation of Israel was birthed out of a rebellious spirit and a church split I'm going somewhere David had a son you say, how in the world do you remember all this? Because I had seven years in prison to do number read books. <laughs> and I've been reading them every day since. <laughs> David, the greatest king of the nation of Israel, right, was the first king that had a united kingdom. How many tribes are there in Israel? Twelve. David was the first king that all 12 tribes came to David and said, we will unite under your reign. David had a son by the name of Solomon, who was the last king that reigned over a united kingdom. Solomon had a son by the name of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, when he became king, felt like he had something to prove. And he looked at the 12 tribes and he says, you think Solomon was tough on you? my little finger will be heavier than his wrist. And 10 of those tribes looked at Rehoboam and said, we have no part or lot in the bloodline of David. And they split, are you ready for this? Much like America almost did 200 years ago in a civil war north and south. The southern kingdom stayed loyal to David. The capital city was Jerusalem, the holy city of Zion, with the temple, with the Ark of the Covenant, where every Jew, don't miss this, where every Jew was commanded to come seven times a year, three of which, if you missed, the board of the church would show up and pull a board out of your house and nail you to it and burn down everything you had. Try missing church in that day. <laughs> kind of tough, right? So here's what happens. The ten tribes that defrock, 
they don't want to serve under David. They form their own nation, the northern nation. They call it Israel. And the king says this, I'm afraid, can I tell you what his name was? Jeroboam, just like Rehoboam. And the king said, I know that if I let the ten tribes go up to Zion and sacrifice to the Lord, their hearts will return to David and I'll lose my kingdom. So what he did, he set up two places. I'm going somewhere. Just stay with me. He set up two places of worship, one in Dan and one in Bethel, Ephraim, the mountains of Samaria. And what he told the ten tribes is, you don't have to listen to what Moses said. You don't have to listen to what's prescribed in the law. You don't have to take your offerings there. You don't have to worship God there. You, if you live in the north, let me give you some comfort. Just go to Tel Dan and worship up there. And if you live in the southern part of Israel, the ten tribes, just come down to Bethel, the mountains of Ephraim, and worship here. Bring your offerings here. And he said, look, we've got priests. So here's what he did. He went over there and said, hey, man, you want to be a priest? You want to be a priest? You want to be a priest? You want to... Here, I'll build some altars. Y'all come... Y'all come sacrifice some sacrifices all right so he opens a crack are you ready for this i'm going somewhere he opens a crack now you know they're worshiping jehovah but they're worshiping jehovah in a way that jehovah said i do not want to be worshiped how many of you know you can die trying to do the right thing can i show it to you david's going to bring the ark of the covenant back to israel they put the ark the presence of god on a cart, big wheels and boards. And they start moving his presence with ox. The ox stumble, the ark gets ready to fall. Uzzah reaches out, doing the right thing, touches the ark, and God kills him. Died trying to do the right thing. Because God said, that's not how you move my presence. You move my presence on the shoulders of men, the Kohathites. See what I'm saying? God prescribed it a certain way. These 10 tribes said, no, we're going to do it our own way. All right, here's where I'm going. When that happened, there was one king after the next king, after the next king, after the next king, until we get to a king by the name of King Ahab. What do you remember Ahab as? He is the ninth king of Israel, and Ahab had a wife that ran the nation. She was a little Jezebel. You remember that? So Jezebel is controlling the nation of Israel. She's controlling the ninth king as her puppet through the nation. But what's happened is when they started saying, you can just have one. <laughs> you want me to leave that alone? Well, you can just talk on the phone for five minutes. You can just have one lunch date. You can just say one swear word. You can just criticize them one time. You can just be a part of that one time. They started opening the cracks saying, hey, we're going to do it our own way. And before you know it, in Tel Dan and in Bethel, they're worshiping the host of heaven. They're worshiping the Baal gods. How much of a lie does it take to come in to make a story a lie? It doesn't take but one perversion. It doesn't take but one mistruth to make the whole thing corrupted. And they started doing it wrong. They rebelled against the bloodline of David. They went and birthed their own church. They went and did their own thing with the wrong heart, with the wrong motives. And then all of a sudden, nine generations later they're sacrificing their children to a god called molech that's bible abortion woman has a baby they take the baby and make it pass through the fire sacrificing to a god of molech joe ash comes on the scene can i bring him to you here he is he is the grandson of jehu do you remember jehu i like to tell people this he's the first bad driver in the bible any everybody ever rode with a pastor to help your prayer life? Anybody? Don't ride with me. I'll get you closer to God, baby. You ride with me. Here's Ahab, Jezebel, sitting in their palace. They look out the window one day, and they say, who's that driving that car? And Ahab looks out, and he said, that's Jehu. He's driving wildly. He's a bad driver. When Jehu comes into the city, he kills Ahab. He kills Jezebel for allowing the false worship. But here's what he does. He's hungry for power to take control of the nation, but he's not hungry for revival. Here's what he says. He says, I want the kingdom, and I want you out 
but I'm not willing to tear down the golden calf in Dan, and I'm not willing to tear down the sacred cow in Bethel. Y'all can keep worshiping Jehovah there because I was after the power, not spiritual reform. So he has a son, Jehu does, by the name of Jehoahaz. J-E-H-O-A-A-A-Z. Jehoahaz. Jehoahaz does the same thing. Great leader, takes control of Israel, keeps it a nation, keeps the Syrians at bay, but doesn't bring reform. Matter of fact, he says you can worship the Baal gods. You can worship the asterisk poles. You can worship all of the story host of heaven. You can sacrifice your children. You don't have to go to Israel. You don't have to go to Jerusalem. You don't have to bring the prescribements in the law. You don't have to do it that way. We can do it our own way. In the book of Deuteronomy, God said this, if you forsake these commandments, if you turn and you do not do the prescribed instructions of this law, I won't do it, but the enemy is coming. A thorn in your flesh. They will pillage your nation. They will take your children. They will put you in bondage. They will put you in, pros- in, in poverty. You will live in despair. It's coming if you don't serve me. Somebody look at your neighbor right now and say, if you don't serve him, if you open just one little crack, who knows where it ends up in five months? Who knows where it ends up in five years? But here's what I can tell you with certainty. The enemy is coming to steal, to kill, to destroy. Somebody say, a window is closing. A window's closing for me today, but here we go. So Jehoahaz has a son. Do you want to know his name? King Joash, King Joash steps on the scene and here the 12th king of the nation of Israel steps on the scene and here's what he finds. That on the eastern border of Israel, there's a nation, a loose confederation of nations. They never join together except for one purpose, to fight Israel, ISIS. Still there. They joined together. They became known as Aram. They had a king by the name of Haziel. He had a son by the name of Ben-Hadad. And Ben-Hadad came into Israel. Watch this. And when he came into Israel, Andy, he destroyed the Israelites' army, and he brought all of their horses out, and he made a man take a sword, and he hamstrung every one of them. And he left the nation with no power, no military might. King Joash becomes the king, the 12th king, comes from three generations of power-hungry fathers, but not hungry for the presence of God, not hungry for spiritual reform. And one day the Syrians say, okay, we've had enough, game over. We're coming to annihilate you and take the whole thing. How many of you know that's what the enemy was always after? Don't just play hoity-toity with him. Don't dilly-dally with him. Don't open the crack in your window because he's really after your soul. He's really after your children. He's really after your marriage. He wants the whole enchilada. And they say, we're coming to take it all. And here it is. You ready for this? Now with the backdrop set, now that you understand the context of this passage, watch this. King Joash one day says, where in the world is Elisha? The reason Elisha is laying in a deathbed dying, the reason he dies with the anointing in his bones is because nobody in the nation is hungry for the power or the presence of God. Have you ever had a fire in your bones to preach? You ever had a fire in your bones to do soup ministry? You ever had a fire in your bones to serve, to make something better, to teach a growth group, and nobody would let you do it? Then it frustrates you, it complicates you, and all of a sudden, it'll cause a bitterness. It'll poison your spirit, and you'll curl up and die. You'll wither spiritually. You will. I've seen it happen. He's laying in that deathbed about to die. Nobody's heard the name Elisha for decades. The nations backslidden, worshiping every God, doing it their way. I'm going to do it my way. And then all of a sudden, this king one day comes in, and let's look at Joash's confession. Maybe they throw this up on the screen for you today. Number one, Joash's confession. Here's what his confession was. Oh, my father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen 
of Israel. I'm going to bring the scriptures to life. I'm going to help you understand the whole thing, what he's really saying. But what I really want you to see is how unusual this is for this young man who doesn't come from the right spiritual lineage, who's headstrong, who's power hungry, who's now powerless. He's in a predicament. He's got his back against the wall. I think I'll just minister this right here for just a moment. You got anybody in your life that needs a turnaround? You got anybody in your life that really needs a change? Well, here's a word from God. Quit in enabling them. Quit giving them $20. Quit giving them a hundred. Quit paying their electric bill. Quit pay- Let them experience a hard time. A hard time will bring them to God. Isn't it funny how a hard time will wake you up to God? Isn't it funny how when the world says life in prison, life is over, sorry, you had your three chances, you out, big boy. And they say go to Angola, Louisiana State Penitentiary for the rest of your life that you'll lay down on a jail cell floor when yesterday you thought you knew everything. You'll lay down and you say, God, I don't know nothing. I'm broke, I'm busted, I'm disgusted. God, I need you. And this is his confession. Watch it. You want me to show it to you? Here's what he says. He says, my father, my father, I hadn't called on you. I ain't text you. I ain't Facebooked you. I didn't put $100 in the offering. I didn't show up on Wednesday. I didn't show up on Sunday. But here's what I know right now. My back's against the wall, and I know that you are the chariots, and you are the horsemen of the nation of Israel. Oh, you don't understand, Steve. I see the look on your face. Well, just think back to his spiritual father. When he got ready to go up to heaven, Elijah, who came and got him, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. Now just back up three chapters in the book of 2 Kings and when Elisha was still doing halfway well before he got brittle, before he got in a deathbed and sick and he still had a spiritual son pulling on him. There was a day when Ben-Hadad and Haziel said, why can't we whip the nation of Israel? We've taken their army. we pillaged their city. Why can't we win? And they said, because there's a prophet down there by the name of Elisha and every military move you make, God tells him what you're doing and then he tells the king, Joe Hay has what you're going to do. And then he says, well, let's go down there and take Elisha out. And Elisha's servant goes out. You know what he was doing first thing in the morning. All the men in the place know. He stepped outside that morning and he looks around and he sees the nation of Aram on the mountain. He sees the Syrians coming to take them captive. He steps back in the tent. He says, uh, Elisha, you might want to get up. We got a little trouble this morning. <laughs> They're not even here for the nation of Israel. They're here for you. Elisha says, Lord, bring him outside. Open his eyes. Let him see God on the mountaintops, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And what the king is saying, you ready for this? The king is saying, I've come to the end of myself. I'm ready to repent. I don't know it all. I don't have all the answers. I'm not powerful enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not talented enough. I'm not good looking enough. Let me just belly up and tell you, I repent. I was wrong. It's the prophetic word in your mouth. It isn't in the bell gods. It isn't in the asterisk pole. It isn't even in the God of Molech. It's in your mouth. The prophetic word in your mouth. It's your word. You are the chariot and the horsemen of Israel. We don't have an army. We don't have victory. We need the word in your mouth. You're my only hope. And here's where I'm really trying to get to this morning. I wonder where our confession is. See, it's easy to look back at Joash. It's easy to scrutinize his confession. It's easy to armchair quarterback his story in the Bible. But I wonder if today you've got some enemies and you've got an east window. I wonder where your confession is. I wonder if we could stand up and say this morning, like the young king, God, you're my only hope. Your prophetic word. You're my deliverer. You're my strong tower. Only in you. Why don't you stand up right now? Come on, why don't you start saying to your own enemy? Why don't you just get your confession right? I've got a hope. I've got a future. I've got a tomorrow. I'm going to have a blessed life. I'm going to have a business. My marriage. Hold on, stay standing. Stay standing. Here, here's what we do. Here's what we do. Stay standing. Here's what we do. How you doing, brother? Oh, fair to middling. Okay, somebody give me a Bible. 
Where, where is that at in there? I've been reading this thing a long time, and I certainly don't know it all, but I am a student. Where is that in there? Where in the world is fair to middling in there? Well, how you doing today, brother? Oh, what's left of me is okay. <laughs> what I read said there ain't no you. What I read said you died, you were buried, and you were resurrected brand new. You were resurrected by the Spirit of God, by the power of God, a new creation that everything you used to love, you don't love anymore. Everything you used to like, you don't like it no more. All things are new. What I read was you're the head and not the tail. What I read said you were above and not beneath. What I read said you were too anointed to be disappointed. What I I read said you were an overcomer. What I read said you win. Come on, get your confession right today. Come on, somebody speak over your own life. Speak over your own life right now. Number two. Number two. See, what I'm trying to do is give you an opportunity to be heroic, not almost. See, Jehovah, Joash, he gets it right. He goes down there and he says, hey. John Skipworth version. Today's modern West Monroe urban version. What's up, big dog? I was wrong, homie. We in a little bit of a tight spot. Can't pay the electric bill. Car notes due. He ain't coming home. I ran around. I'm going to need a little help. And I know you got the answer because I don't. It's the word in your mouth. What does the prophet have to say? To, isn't it amazing? And Pastor Alex can tell you this. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> isn't it amazing that somebody will say, Pastor Alex, what should I do? Pastor Alex, could you line up counseling with my son? And then Pastor Alex will say, well, here's what the Bible says. And here's what I've learned in my life through trial and error. And then they'll walk right out and won't do what you tell them to do. But next week, next week, Pastor Alex, could I have another hour? Could I have another three hours? Could I have another six months? Could I make you make me feel better? Would you? But when you say, hey, you need to start saying, God's my only hope. This book has the only answers. My future is blessed. I'm going to get this right. God's going to come through. We're going to win this thing. It goes right through. Right through. Go right through. But here's what I've learned. Let him wake up in a bottom bunk. Let him wake up in an orange jumpsuit. Let him wake up in rehab. Let him wake up to an ad in the paper that says DWI. Let him wake up to an empty house with no furniture. Let her wake up with a bank account with zero dollars in it. Let her wake up when her children won't answer a phone call anymore. Let them wake up and then they'll get to say it. My God, my God, you're my only hope. You're my only deliverer. You're my only savior. You're my only son. I need you, God. I'll listen. I'll apply. I'll obey. They get their confession right. Have a seat. Number two. Number two. Number two, I'm trying to give you a chance to be heroic. Stop walking out of here, mealy mouth Christian. Well, what's left of me? I don't know what I want to do. He won't straighten up. She won't act right. We can't get along. I'm there. It's his mama. No, it's her mama. No, it's there. What in the world? You're looking at all the problems instead of the solution. You got to look at what you do have, not at what you don't have. What did he give you to work with? I'm taking some counseling frustration out right now. Hey! Somebody shout, it'll make me feel better. Just shout. Just shout, it'll make me feel better. Number two, trying to teach us about this character, Joash, who was heroic, almost. Joash's actions, I'm gonna show it to you. Elisha said to him, take a bow and some arrows. So he took a bow and some arrows. 
And then he said to the king of Israel, put it in your hand. So he put it in his hand. Watch this. And then Elijah put his hand. He must have got out of the sick bed. Do you see him? Somebody's pulling on him. On the, he's starting to come back to life. He's getting out of the bed, putting his hands on the bow. So he says, okay, watch this. He says, now open that east window. He opens the east window. He said, shoot. And he shot. And he said, watch this. This is the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. This is the arrow of the Lord's deliverance over Syria. For you must go to Apec. Can I tell you where Apec is? Apec's not in Syria. Apec is in Israel. You want to know why it's in Israel? Because the Syrians had already crossed the border and were already in Israel taking Israelite cities. He said, go to Apec, which is as far as they've gotten, and drive them back. Utterly destroy them. And then, and then watch this. Here's what I want you to see. He said, take a bow and some arrows. Take a bow and some arrows. One question. They're in Elisha's house. I can show you where Elisha was at in the book of 2 Kings. He was living in object object poverty. You want me to show it to you? Remember Naaman the Syrian? Jesus quoted him in the New Testament when he says, was there not lepers in the land of Israel that could have been healed? Ha ha. But only Naaman the Syrian went and sought out Elisha. You thought I made that up. There were people in Israel with leprosy, but nobody was hungry for the power and the presence of the word of God. And Naaman, a Syrian, went at the word of a servant girl that the Syrians captured from the Israelites on a Syrian raid. Went back and told her mistress, said, there's a prophet in Israel. And if your husband Naaman goes down there and talks to him, he'll heal him of leprosy. Remember where Naaman found him? In the backside of nowhere, living in a little bitty hut. Nobody wanted anything to do, and the nation was backslidden. Watch this. He finds him in this little hut in, the, in obscurity, nowhere. And he says, get a bow and some arrows. Where'd the bow come from? Where'd the arrows come from? Maybe Israel didn't have an army. Maybe, maybe the king's personal security. Maybe they had a bow and an arrow. Okay, maybe so. Or maybe the old prophet had a bow over on his wall. Maybe he had an arrow on his wall. But nonetheless, here's the point I'm trying to get across. There were spiritual weapons in arm's reach. There were spiritual weapons readily available. See, 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 I've helped you get your confession right. Now I'm fixing to help you get your actions right. And what I'm trying to get you to see is as a Christian, there are spiritual weapons within arm's reach, but you just ain't using them. You say, well, what weapon do I have to fight poverty, to fight racism, to fight hatred, to fight divorce, to fight drug addiction, to fight alcoholism? Well, let me tell you, it's the weapon of your faith. Come on, somebody stand up on your feet right now. Watch this. Why don't you just express some faith that he's really up there. Come on, shout to him right now. It's, watch it. It's the weapon of your worship. you got a weapon. Hey! I believe that you're there. I believe that you're the God that is a rewarder of those that diligently seek you. Watch this. You've got the weapon of your faith. You've got the weapon of your worship. You've got the weapon of the promises of God. You've got the weapon. Watch this. That every spiritual gift in heavenly places was given to you and me in Christ Jesus. That means God didn't keep anything back. He gave it all to you. It means you and I are just not using it. We've got spiritual weapons in arm's reach readily available. See, I've got some teenagers. They don't want to walk right. They don't want to talk right. They don't want to act right. They don't want to answer their phone at night. They want to sleep around. They want to lay out. Why don't you just reach right over and grab you one of those weapons that say, train up a child in the way that he should go, that she should go. And when she is old, when he is old, she want to, hey, what I'm trying to show you is you got some enemies in your life coming from your eastern flank, from your eastern border. And what you need to do and what I need to do Open your east window, not your north window, not your south window, not your west window. Open the east window. Open the window where the enemy's coming from. You know right now the Holy Spirit's talking to you. It's at that bar room. It's at that lottery counter. It's at that drug house. It's at that little girl down at O'Reilly Auto Ports. 
that's blatting her eyes at you. You know where it is. It's at that breakfast table. It's at that racism. It's at that criticism. Open that east window and reach in the spiritual armory of God's word and shoot you an arrow of deliverance. Shoot you an arrow of deliverance from poverty. Shoot you an arrow of deliverance of racism. Shoot you an arrow of deliverance over alcoholism. Shoot you an arrow of deliverance over drunkenness. Shoot you an arrow of deliverance over a generational curse of divorce. Shoot you an arrow. Stop waiting for somebody to shoot your arrow for you. You reach in and shoot you an arrow. I'm trying to give you an opportunity to be heroic. I'm trying to tell you, listen, these ain't the only people. They were men with natures just like ours. They were men that never knew and saw clearly the resurrection of Jesus. These were men that never had the baptism and the power of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. They didn't know what it was to have what we have, but they were heroic. They would go down into lion's dens on snowy days. They would lead children and nations out of bondage. Come on, I'm talking about you stepping up, being heroic. I'm talking about you get your talk right, you get your walk right. Come on, step up somebody today and shoot you an arrow. Get your actions right. Leonard Ravenhill said, you have to seize the opportunity of a lifetime in the lifetime of an opportunity. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, a window is closing. A window's closing. Number three, as we get ready to go, I want you to look at this. Joe Ash's commitment. Pastor Chad, would you please come? Then he said, take the arrows. So he took them. And the king of Israel, he said to him, strike the ground. Here you go, sir. So he struck it three times. Thank you, Pastor Christopher. Then all of a sudden, the man of God was angry with him and said, should you have not struck the ground five times? Should you have not struck the ground six times? And then he crawled up in his deathbed and he died and a window closed. Here's what I've discovered about Christians. A lot of times we do just enough to survive, but not enough to thrive. See what I'm trying to get you to see this morning? Isn't it amazing how God, you, you can get your little talk right. I'm blessed and highly favored. I shall speak evil of no man. Have dignity and honor the king. And we think that's it. No, that's not it. That's one part of it. And then we say, okay, I'm getting my actions right. And instead of when he doesn't come home, getting on the phone, I get down on my knees and go to the throne. When she... can't seem to figure out how to be monogamous in our relationship and for us to have exclusivity sexually with one another instead of taking my dirty laundry to Facebook I take it to God's holy book so now we got our confession right we got some of our actions right I'm in church, I'm tithing, I'm doing the right thing, I'm singing in the choir, I'm speaking right, and then God, just like God, he goes right to the heart of the matter. 
And he says, but it's your commitment. It's your commitment. Here's what I'm trying to show you. So he says, get you some arrows. Well, I already got an arrow. That's what you would have said. I already shot my arrow. I shot it 15 months ago, and it didn't happen when I wanted it to happen. No, that's right, because I'm Jehovah nick of time. I come through just in the nick of time, not on your time. But see, what I'm really after, you got your talk right, you got your walk right, but you ain't committed, King Joash. See, you got a chance, young king, to lead not only in power, but in spiritual reform. Come on, son, get your confession right. Come on, son, get your actions right. And listen, this may take a little minute. I want you to get those arrows, and I want you to begin to strike them on the ground. And here's what happened. Joash's blackberry went off. Uh, excuse me. It's five minutes after the prescribed time that we leave church. I have to go. Oh, excuse me. Uh, hold on, my iPhone just went off. Oh, I just got an email. My girlfriend would like to go to Portico tonight and have a couple of drinks. I go, excuse me. He says, hold on, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, God, go and close that window. I'm getting back up in the bed. You ain't committed. Because see, if you was really committed when you shot that arrow and you got your wife and your life moving in the right direction, even if it took a little while, you would have been in your prayer closet and you'd have been over there striking those arrows. God, I ain't giving up. I'm not letting go. I know I don't see it yet, but it's coming. I am an overcomer. I am a light of the world. I am. It isn't what other men think about me. It isn't their expectations. It isn't their aspirations. It isn't what they think about my wife. I ain't giving up. I'm committed. We go win this day. Oh, I ain't giving up. I'm in. I'm in. Don't tell me you're committed to what God said he's committed to doing when God delivered you from drinking, but you go back and say it's okay to have just one. Don't tell me I'm committed when he took you out of the crack house and you think it's all right to run around with the crack dealer. Don't tell me you're committed when you can't get in the prayer closet and strike those arrows.